Good afternoon. It is my <clears throat> it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event. My name is Rafael Perez Figueroa. And Alison, can you go to the next slide? I'm an assistant professor of health behavior in society um, in the University of Kentucky College of Public Health. This event is being sponsored by the Center of Health Equity Transformation, the Center for Innovation in Population Health in our college. Can you go to the next slide, Alison? In the following one, it takes a community to organize an event like this, and I want to thank all the people that have made it possible, uh, especially to our Dean Donna Arnett and Dr. Nancy Schomberg, uh, Director of the Center of Health Equity Transformation. Can you go to the next slide? I also want to acknowledge the collaboration of my colleague, Dr. Katie Cardarelli. She has partnered with me conceptualizing and coordinating all the events in this program, NETS. This month, last year, after the killing of Breonna Taylor, we started planning a program to build understanding on the relationship between structural racism and health inequities, NETS. This is the last event of this program, and our goal is to foster an anti-racist environment in our academic community, and hopefully in the nation. Next. We started this program with Dr. Robert Fully Love. He's a professor of sociomedical sciences at Columbia University, and he discussed mass incarceration as a driver of health inequities among Black communities. Dr. Fully Love, framed mass incarceration from a historical perspective rooted in slavery and highlighted the criminal justice system as an structure plausible for public health interventions in communities of color. He showed us data on how this is being implemented in New York City. Next. Dr. Gilbert G, professor of community health sciences at UCLA, discusses structural racism emphasizing on a system science approach. He underscored the inequities of Asian Americans and analyzed how discriminatory narrative against this group generate structural violence. The same hateful and discriminatory narrative that fueled the shootings that killed nine women of Asian descent this month. In my opinion, his presentation emphasized the need of not only discussing these issues, but actually acting on them. Next, Dr. Luisa Borrell, distinguished professor of the City University of New York and a good friend, discussed health inequities among the Latinx population. She, explore, she explained how we, people of Latin American descent, are put in a bus as a Hispanic uh, in the context of the United States what are the implications of that for making sense of health data and making critical public health decisions? Her main message was stressing the importance of collecting better quality and more comprehensive population level data to target public health interventions. Next, the previous one. Dr. Marianne Hamedani from Stanford University discussed the idea of undoing racism. How as an academic community, we can participate doing this. She presented a toolbox developed at the Spark Dutan titled Race Words. Our goal with sharing this toolbox was to facilitate the process of engaging in conversations around race in our academic community. All these presentations are available online and you can access to them. Next, the event today builds on this effort to create an anti-racist environment. Next, critical race theory is a transdisciplinary approach that explicitly addresses the role of race, emphasizes on historical and contemporary social dynamics, focus on communities in the margins, and can be embraced as an enduring practice, a practice 
that is collaborative in nature, that is community engaged, that is responsible and aimed at social justice. Our speaker today is a proponent of a framework, public health critical race praxis, for applying a critical race perspective in research and in public health practice. Next. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chandra Ford. She's a professor of community health sciences and the funding director of the Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice and Health at UCLA. In 2019, she was the lead editor of Racism, Science and Tools for the Public Health Professional, an APHA press book that has received a lot of attention in the field. Her work focused on the study of racism as a public health problem applied to multiple issues, including HIV AIDS, the study of sexual and gender minorities, and intimate partner violence. She has received many awards, including the Way Hampton Frost Award from the American Public Health Association in 2020. I can continue highlighting her achievement for a long time, but I will rather let her speak. So please join me welcoming Dr. Chandra Ford. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry about the inconvenience uh, with the technical difficulty. Thank you so very much for this invitation and the warm reception I've received over um, the last uh, few months that we've been working on this. Um, I in particular want to thank you, Dr. Perez Figueroa and Dr. Cardarelli. And the title of my talk is A Deeper Understanding of Racism in the Pandemic, in the COVID-19 Pandemic, Lessons from Public Health Critical Race Practice. Um, I conduct my work in Southern California on lands originally inhabited by and cared for by the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. And so I want to acknowledge them as the original caretakers of the land as a way of bringing to light that even those of us who have legitimate claims about US racism nevertheless benefit from the injustices historically and continue to this present day against uh, the indigenous peoples of the Americas. What I wanna do today is first define racism and then really talk a bit about the public health critical race praxis, its origins in critical race theory um, in law, the process of this praxis and several principles, which I'll illustrate um, just a couple in terms of how they might be useful for understanding and thinking about racism in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, I want to offer three um, potential simple solutions to some of the ways that racism matters in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the media, in our professional societies, in our communities and our homes, most people are concerned about COVID-19. Others are concerned about racism. We in public health should be concerned about both. And so I ask to start us off here, how does racism matter to the COVID-19 pandemic? And there are many ways to respond to this question. Indeed, each one of us could respond to it differently. And each of those responses would reflect the lens through which we understand the, the question and also the assumptions that, uh, that the underlying assumptions that are tied to each of our lenses. My response to this question and my remarks today are rooted in public health critical race praxis. And the value of relying on this praxis for me is that it helps to make perceptible the subtle and often imperceptible ways that racism can be at work in this public health crisis during the early 21st century. Before getting into the praxis, allow me to define racism. Tamara Jones, former president of the American Public Health Association, 
has defined it as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks. That social interpretation is what we often refer to as race. This system unfairly disadvantages some and it unfairly advantages others. And in so doing, it saps the strength of the whole society. And here the term unfairly is meant to convey that these disadvantages and advantages are not earned, that they are bestowed upon people by virtue of the racial category to which they are assigned. This praxis, public health critical race praxis, is a racism focused research approach that Collins, Ari, and Bua and I organized some 10 years ago as such. Our goals were to bolster the capacity of health equity researchers to conduct rigorous research that explicitly targets racism while at the same time working to advance an anti-racism movement within the field of public health. To achieve this, the approach integrates both health equity strategies and conventional scientific approaches, as well as selected principles and practices from critical race theory, in particular, the versions of critical race theory that originated in law in the late 1980s. So this practice has three main components. The first is uh, a race conscious, a racism conscious orientation, uh, a lexicon, that's based on critical race theory. We use those as principles. They're considered principles within critical race theory more broadly um, that are the building box blocks for the public health critical race praxis research process. And finally, this semi-structured self-reflective research approach. The key questions that we engage for every project are first, how is racism relevant to this problem? And at the same time, how does racism influence the production of knowledge about this problem? That is, how does racism influence what we understand um, as a result of the research that we conduct on this problem? And these questions apply whether the problem is explicitly focused on racism or not, because with critical race theory, as with public health critical race praxis, the goal is to understand how racism operates in the contemporary social environment, one, which, one in which um, much of the fundamental ways that racism, racism is operating are not immediately apparent. I've used the term critical race theory several times. Um, it can be defined as a collection of activists and scholars who are interested in studying and addressing, excuse me, interested in studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. Um, it emerged among Black, Indigenous, and people of color or BIPOC legal scholars in the late 1980s in US law schools. And this is important in terms of thinking about the ways that it can be specific to how racism operates in the United States, though it also has been found useful in global contexts and for explaining uh, relations between nations and populations. Health crits, and by that I mean critical race theorists who focus on health, use critical race theory, in particular the offshoot the offshoot I'm referring to as public health critical race praxis in order to bring otherwise imperceptible racism mechanisms to light. Racism is not the only factor that drives health outcomes, however, but for critical race theorists, it is important to focus on racism because racism remains such a dominant force in shaping the lives of populations and, and the well being of populations. And many would argue that it is the dominant force and that there are no circumstances in which we are disconnected from the racial order, ordering uh, that occurs as a result of racism. The public health critical race praxis research process 
is intended to help researchers in studying how racism is relevant to a problem, even when the primary focus of the research is not explicitly racism related. So we draw on a set of critical race theory derived principles. The researcher first establishes an explicit racially conscious orientation. And by racially conscious orientation, I'm not saying that we are focused on classifying people simply by their skin color, but that we are acknowledging the ways in which racism operates in our society today and also acknowledging the salience of racism for our own selves personally as we endeavor to begin a particular project. And this is the broader racism conscious frame or lens. Um, and then assess the current racial dynamics in society. So it's possible that we could assess very um, forms of racism that are easy to recognize because we've seen them in the past. But can we capture salient ways that racism is operating today that are often more difficult to perceive precisely because they're occurring in this moment? And this is, if we think of this moment as a picture, we're part of the picture. Um, so that is nevertheless the first stage, the first focus, which is to try to enumerate specific ways that contemporary racial dynamics are relevant to a project. Then move to the uh, second focus, which is in a space where researchers focus on clarifying how racialization may already be embedded in the literature. And this is important because in empirical research, each study is just an incremental contribution to a larger body of knowledge. And certainly we must cite uh, and engage the existing knowledge. But if that existing knowledge embeds racist assumptions um, and, and so forth, then it is important to illuminate the implications of that for an immediate project. The next phase is actually focus three, which is to try to find ways to incorporate the prior focuses and to allow that information to inform the operationalization of measures. Um, and then the final focus is focus four, where researcher tries to build on either the findings from the study or the knowledge gained from the process of carrying out the work in order to take some kind of action that will help to remedy the problem. There are 10 principles associated with this praxis. In the interest, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna highlight uh, three. Um, and they are race, a social construct, the social construction of knowledge and critical approaches. In public health, as in biomedicine in general, we routinely include measures of race and ethnicity in our studies and in pretty much everything that we do. It's important for us to think about the ways that race is a social construct, and it has become increasingly common for people uh, within the field of public health to say race is a social construct, and that marks a, an important um, advance in our field. That statement has two connotations, and often I find, for instance, with my students, that they readily recognize the negative implication of this statement. That is to say race is a social construct is to say that race is not fundamentally a biological construct and that's true. But there's a second connotation of this statement and um, it has to do with what race is, not what race is not. And Ian Haney Lopez defines it as a vast group of people loosely bound together by historically contingent, socially significant elements of their morphology and or ancestry. So the social construction of race here clearly challenges the notion that race can be measured precisely using epidemiologic tools, for instance. Um, Heyman and Levitt put it, the ways in which race orders and constrains us have reconstitutive effects 
and ensure that race becomes in social fact, race becomes in social fact what it is supposed to be in naturalist theory, and that is a differentiating trait that orders us in hierarchical terms as members of inferior or superior races. Now, we would not use the language of inferior or superior races today. However, much of the way that we process uh, race and use it in our studies um, actually is doing precisely that. So these definitions are useful for those of us who are interested in the social construction of race because they let us know that if we want to understand how racism is affecting health, these are the, the measures of race that we need to strive to try to capture. It's also important to understand that ethnicity is a social construct too. In addition to the cultural dimensions of ethnicity, which might be considered one dimension of a two-dimensional ethnicity construct, there are relational aspects of ethnicity. And these relational aspects, what Naina Haraba and I call the relational dimension of ethnicity, really tell us something about how an ethnically defined population is related to, relative to the dominant group in a society, to other groups in society, and along existing social hierarchies within a society. So for those of us who are interested in understanding how racism affects the well-being of ethnically defined populations, understanding the social construction of ethnicity is critical. And it helps us to identify the social determinants of health and inequities, of health inequities for ethnically defined populations to account for variability that might occur within ethnically defined populations, but across regions, improve public health surveillance tools in ways that make it meaningful for these populations and improve practice in uh, minoritized communities. Now, critical race theory and public health critical race praxis soundly reject the idea that empirical research is inherently free from racial or other bias. Historical analyses clearly show that bias, including racial bias, can influence research questions, a priori assumptions, which populations are of interest to a project, the conclusions drawn based on the findings, and so on. Empirical research is a systematic process. However, the systematic nature of research does not inherently render it free from any bias. Though because it improves reliability, it may render any unacknowledged biases reproducible. So why does this matter? It means that we must assess and explicate our biases to the extent that we can as we begin a project and document these biases along the way. This allows us to better understand the motivations of our research questions, and it allows readers to understand how we may have reached the conclusions that we reached. Now, I would say there are many reasons why racism matters in the context of COVID-19, but let me just highlight three. It's important to talk about racism in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic because it persists both in society and in our field. Also, racism matters because racism is intensified during pandemics. And finally, racism matters in the COVID-19 pandemic because we cannot achieve equity without addressing racism. Now, the social construction of race and ethnicity and the social construction of knowledge, as well as um, you know, other principles from uh, public health critical race praxis are not just esoteric ideas. They suggest that even when looking at data such as these, um, that there are questions that we need to ask and that there are 
understandings that cannot be fully gauged um, even from, from data such as these. So um, for instance, we would have to acknowledge that data on race and ethnicity, first of all, were not even available at the beginning of the pandemic. Of course, this raises questions about equity um, and that it was not po even possible to track racial and ethnic inequities at the beginning of the pandemic. Several of the questions that it raises for me include these principles from critical race theory raise include how is racism operating here? So anytime we see health outcomes that are best categorized or explained not by health risk factors, but by social constructs, it should raise for us a warning sign, a warning flag that something is going on here that, that tells us something about the social exposures, uh, not the biological characteristics of the populations being impacted. It raises questions about who counts within each category. It raises questions about um, how, rather than what it is about identity, what are these social specific social exposures? And it also raises questions about whether there are more meaningful ways to categorize the populations in order to reflect to better reflect homogeneity within the specified groups. We could go on with other questions, for instance, um, thinking about how uh, uh, Pacific Islander populations have moved over censuses from being categorized with Native Hawaiians, formerly being categorized with Asians. Are there different contexts um, in which a group such as Pacific Islanders should be categorized with one or the other? What are the implications for understanding exposures such as the hate crimes that Asian Americans and Asians in America are experiencing right now during this pandemic? The most overt racism occurring during the pandemic are the hate crimes and hate incidents as the FBI would categorize them. Um, that Stigmatization and hate crimes have targeted Asians since the beginning of the epidemic really underscores how inextricably linked racism is to this pandemic. This pandemic has never, another way to put this is, this pandemic has never existed in the US outside of racism. And so while some may see the pandemic and then think of racism emerging within it, another way to see it is racism has existed and the pandemic emerged within uh, an already existing frame and experience of racism. As extreme and terrorizing as these particular forms of racism are, it's also important to keep in mind that um, racism affects health largely by less conspicuous mechanisms. Um, they include segregation and other structural forms of racism environmental racism, which contributes to high rates of asthma and other respiratory conditions in communities of color and is likely a driver of COVID-19 inequities, as well as colorblind and aversive forms of racism. And these forms of racism reinforce white supremacy by subtly denying the salience of racism. And I would say we could actually think about the intersection of these less conspicuous in overt forms of racism and how they actually um, actually exacerbate the overt forms, exacerbate and enable the overt forms of racism. Um, and here, a hypothetical example that might be useful is to think about members of a population who repeatedly cry out that they are experiencing hate, that they are seeing red flags in their community, that they are being treated unfairly, but to have those concerns ignored or diminished until something egregious and something that we are unable to ignore occurs. So um, that may be an example that, um, that, that helps to make that point a little clearer. A substantial body of evidence shows not only that racism exists, making um, racism a social problem, but that it increases risk of illness and health 
which makes it a public health problem. And I will say that while it generally does contribute to worse health outcomes, it's important to recognize that minoritized communities also exercise agency and resilience. And there are ways in which people, uh, communities develop strategies to survive and overcome and, and even thrive in spite of racism. How racism affects access to and quality of healthcare is particularly important in the COVID pandemic because the healthcare system plays a central role in control of the pandemic and care of individuals who become infected. Now, of concern, however, racism not only affects the access to, so so much uh, focus is often placed on, for instance, under insurance in, among minoritized populations, but we know that even among people who have good access to care, differences occur in the kind of treatment patients receive within the healthcare system, and people are increasingly using terms like hospital segregation to explain how patients, uh, racial and ethnic minority patients within the healthcare system are essentially tracked into a different level of care than um, their white counterparts. And recent examples that stand out include those of Black maternal mortality or risk of Black maternal mortality among, for instance, Serena Williams, the famous tennis player, um, due to having their concerns when raised with their provider overlooked or dismissed. It's important uh, to recognize the ways that racism and epidemics intersect. In the past, when health emergencies have occurred, the failure to acknowledge health equity concerns um, generated persistent and preventable damage to populations. And this often became, has become, became exacerbated over time. And this has been documented for um, cholera, for instance, uh, in Haiti and in Venezuela. And often the tendency is to focus only on what seems like the public health issue, putting social problems um, sort of on the back burner. And the prior research suggests that these two are so intertwined that we can never really fully address the pandemic issues without addressing the ways in which a society is already racialized and um, potentially exacerbating the pandemic within pockets of minority and marginalized communities. Strong parallels exist between racism and stigma in the HIV epidemic and racialized stigma in the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think that thinking about the ways that racism was salient to HIV can be instructive for thinking about how to address racism in the COVID-19 pandemic. In the remaining time, I just wanna highlight what I think are three potential solutions. Um, having defined racism, explained what the public health critical race praxis model is and discuss briefly how to apply some principles from critical race theory in, in order to perceive racism at work in the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the solutions I want to recommend are to center equity, embrace anti-racism, and take evidence-based action. And Dr. Jones, uh, Kamara Jones, defines equity as assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. To achieve health equity requires valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices, and providing resources according to need. Stephen Thomas and his colleagues discuss how we can move towards embracing anti-racism when they presented this model about the gener fourth generation of health disparities research. So the first generation was really documenting that disparities exist and that was itself a breakthrough and a landmark. The next generation explained the causes of the disparities. 
or at least many of the causes of disparities. The third generation focused on developing solutions to the disparities. And the fourth generation has called for reliance on public health critical race praxis to move towards an anti-racism approach. And anti-racism is a commitment to dismantle racism across all socioecologic levels. It involves acknowledging the destructive power of racism in society, attempting to ameliorate it, and maintaining a critical stance toward racism and racial exclusion within our field. Um, Anti-racism research follows the lead of communities and the priorities they set. To advance anti-racism is to study how racism influences the distributions and determinants of disease in populations, while at the same time actively working to illuminate and undermine how racialization is operating um, within our field. So anti-racism research in order to advance the cause of equity must involve challenging um, research that challenges racist research directly. Um, it must raise overlooked questions and study problems of import to minor marginalized communities and develop new approaches and tools. And I believe that this development of new approaches and tools is really a challenge for us and an opportunity that the COVID-19 pandemic presents in part because of the reliance on new strategies such as system science and um, the, the wide scale, widespread use of data science uh, for tracking, monitoring, addressing um, COVID-19 outcomes and disparities. So what can we do about, what can the regular person do about uh, racism within our field? I actually believe that still despite more than two decades of research in the area of racism and health, just naming racism as a social exposure is an important contribution. And I think it's important for each of us to do that, not only in our work, that is to study it explicitly, but also in our conversations about inequities. It's important to study it for us to develop substantive expertise and here I want to draw a distinction between um, the ways in which people might study, for instance, a virus and develop substantive expertise around that. And the ease with which people often see themselves as being competent already in uh, how racism uh, works or, and how it matters or not um, in understandings about race and ethnicity and disparities. So I think there needs to be a greater recognition of the ways in which this is actually an area of study. And the theories that you are having here is a beautiful demonstration of that commitment. And then finally, I believe that, again, each of us as just regular people within the field can commit to addressing it. And in particular, starting with ourselves, our field and our institution and this is particularly important for um, what we might think of ways to address liberal quote unquote forms of racism. Those that occur in the helping fields like public health, where we espouse principles of equity and nevertheless manage to reproduce inequities. Now there are a number of resources to guide us in taking evidence-based action. Um, and so I do wanna just highlight these here um, because we are not starting from scratch. And the fact that we can even name racism today reflects the hard sacrifices that others have made along the way um, to advance this, this type of work. And with that, Thank you. Happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ford. Uh, you did a wonderful job of showing us how far we've come, uh, particularly in the area of research and public health. 
but so um, so much more to go in terms of, of uh, making an impact here. So I'd like to uh, ask our audience to um, drop any questions that you have in the Q&A function. Um, and I'm gonna start with this first one here. I'm gonna provide maybe a little bit of context. So there's a question in here um, that I believe is referring to um, a podcast on racism in medicine that was hosted by the deputy editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, um, that has since been removed. And the editor-in-chief of JAMA um, is currently on administrative leave uh, for that podcast um, that questioned whether racism in medicine even existed. And so I wanna um, give you the opportunity, Dr. Ford, to comment on that. But I also, before I, I let you answer that, I also wanna mention that you're probably aware that that JAMA, um, I believe it was about a month ago, February 22nd, actually put out an editorial in which um, they are asking for comments. It, it appears as though they might be changing their um, instructions for authors um, specifically to clarify uh, the concepts of race and ethnicity. Um, you know, are they, you know, if they are going to be included in a study that's submitted for, to JAMA, um, at this point, they're, they're suggesting that they may ask authors to clarify their conceptualization of those variables um, and how they measured them, which would be a, um, a significant uh, disruption to the way biomedical research has worked in the past with regard to those variables. So, Dr. Ford, can you um, comment on uh, the, the podcast, Racism in Medicine, and, uh, and, and that editorial, if you've seen it? Yes, um, thank you for the question. That um, issue really that that issue um, really illustrates the pro the point that I was just making, um, and that is a, a challenge that racism researchers face routinely, and that is unlike, for instance, a, a rare um, virus or something else where people. Um, who are not experts can clearly see they lack that expertise. Often with race and ethnicity, and certainly these aren't the only, um, you know, variables or, or constructs that this applies to, but certainly with race and ethnicity and racism, many people, I would say almost everyone feels like they already know or understand um, what the constructs are, what the relationships are, what it means, and so forth. And so um, I do think it's notable that uh, they don't, it, for experts to talk about racism without actually being experts in racism is, um, is concerning. And uh, there's not a whole lot to say there, except that this is an old pattern and trend, and that it occurred in JAMA is not, um, is is um, you know it it in some ways it's actually not remarkable because there were already um, problems with the, this dynamic already existed there. Um, biomedical journal editors um, more than a decade ago had released a statement and actually updated the statement to convey precisely that when people use race and ethnicity in their studies that they should explain how they measured it, why they were making the claims that they made about disparities, um, about the conclusions that they were making about disparities, for instance. And so it has been really interesting to me to observe very little change over the course of the last decade in how research um, on race and ethnicity um, has, how little it has actually changed um, after that statement. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Ford, can you elaborate on how you approach and operationalize racism and social positioning in your research practice? Is there a, a systematic approach that we should, we should consider in that process? It really differs depending on the study. So if we think about racism as being an umbrella term for a nearly infinite number of um, types of exposures, then 
then we realize that what's most important is to identify the kinds of ways that racism is operating in a particular context and not try to capture racism comprehensively. One way that I've tried to mark this shift is by using terms like racialization rather than racism. Um, hopefully what that shift marks, that change in language marks is that while sometimes we might think of racism as a discrete exposure that an individual or a population has, what I'm interested in with racialization is how the racialized structuring of our society is affecting all groups, but affecting them in different ways. For some groups, it is imposing unearned penalties and harms upon them. So how can we identify what goes what, what are the pathways through which those harms are occurring? And for other groups, and this is important because we don't do it well, we don't do it enough in our work. It's actually providing benefits um, and advantages, health protective benefits. And the two are linked. Um, so the way that I go about it is by trying to draw on some of these principles from public health critical race praxis, which already outlined specific ways that racism is operating. Thank you. So you, you brought up um, systems um, and, and you mentioned that many systems such as biomedical journals are historically grounded in certain philosophies or practices. Um, so also is academia and you know community engaged researchers who are working on um, race related studies have a lot of challenges um, to thrive in academia um, and, and notably one of those challenges is how academic institutions evaluate them relative to some of the um, additional uh, activities such as um, you know action orientation to some of the research that is important to communities as an example. But what do you think academic institutions can do to build a more equitable environment for uh, scholars who are engaged in this work? I think the first step is for institutions to recognize that equity is not charity. Equity is not a product. It is not something that can be handed to community. Equity is a process, fundamentally. And if community folk are not at the table, engaged in and driving that process, there are going to be um, serious questions about how equitable the outcomes of that, of any endeavor are. So that to me is number one. And that might be the only one that really matters because it really, if the process really matters, then that will shape um, what happens. So involving community, uh, you know, from the very beginning is certainly important, but recognizing that academic institutions uh, cannot just, um, cannot control um, the process because the issue here is one of power and to, um, to treat merely attaining equal rates of, of disease or death in community um, and to define that as equity rather than the process while retaining the, the all decision-making power and other forms of power, evaluation power um, over communities um, essentially nullifies, nullifies and neutralizes the, um, the, the whole process of, of pursuing equity. Thank you. We have a question uh, from our audience uh, that's asking about um, whether there are differences of applying your approach in urban versus rural settings. Are there any nuances? Um, the short answer is no, because the approach, in order to be critical, it draws on the sort of a criti critical epistemological frame, which is to, to think about what's relevant in the work that you're doing, not necessarily to use the, what has worked elsewhere. And so in that respect, it does not dictate that there should be a way that, that um, a project should be undertaken in an urban or rural or any other large, small, other kind of context. Um, 
what I will say is that it's important to challenge the way the literature has oversimplified racial and ethnic disparities. And it has generally collapsed what it has meant to be, for instance, Black, to mean a person living in an urban, a very particular kind of urban context and make comparisons um, to other people who may or may not even fit and also of a particular socioeconomic class um, without even making what I would say are really legitimate and appropriate and fair comparisons. And so I think there's more to be learned by, by critiquing the literature. Um, and uh, one of my former doctoral students, Julia Caldwell, has really tried to tease this out. How, for instance, segregation matters in rural versus urban contexts for influencing access to care. Um, so I, those are absolutely critical questions. And um, for the, the person who asked the question, I salute you in, in raising it. Thank you, and I love, I love your, um, you know, let's challenge the literature concept. I have a number of my graduate students who are, are in the meeting today. So this is my shout out to CPA 648 students who are joining us. And I, I, I look forward to seeing your questions in the, in the Q&A box. Um, so we have a question uh, from our audience uh, that relates to a large number of these voter suppression laws that are being passed uh, by state legislatures. And the question is, um, how does critical race theory, uh, critical race praxis articulate the relationship between laws that aren't directly health related and racial inequity? And then any thoughts about steps that can be taken to counteract the effects of such laws? A critical race theory does not draw a distinction between those that are, well, I'll speak for a public health critical race praxis, does not draw a distinction between those that are explicit in naming racism or, or race that we can clearly see, that we might easily define as this is a racist law versus those to, that, that do not, um, because it's more concerned with how does it function, how does it operate. Um, and in that sense, part of the way that it operates might be the language and nomenclature of the law itself. So how explicit it is about race becomes simply part of understanding and explaining how the mechanism by which racism is operating here. And in the early 21st century, our society and racism has become extremely savvy and, um, and smooth at uh, reinforcing inequities while espousing um, equity, reinforcing racism and enacting racism while proclaiming to be anti-racist. And so critical race theory is about how do you understand the tension? Well, how do you understand a situation in which that's the case? And these um, laws and, and the work to advance them is actually a perfect example of that. In terms of what to do about them, I don't have a, a clear answer on that. And I would defer to, for instance, community organizers who've been struggling in the local communities in particular, who understand what's happening in their local communities and what has been happening there for generations. Um, but in terms of health, I think that we do need to be looking at these to understand both, not only how this affects health, also how is public health contributing to this practice, right? Is there a role that public health is playing in support of it? Um, and why on earth would I be saying that? because we know that historically the public health system has played a role, whether it's in information sharing, um, surveillance, whether it's um, how we monitor immigrant populations, how we define what constitutes independence, health um, versus disease in populations, that these things are then taken up as the basis for the kinds of laws that are made um, 
supposedly in the best interest of the overall population. So those are a couple of thoughts that I have for that very thoughtful question. Thank you. I appreciate that. So um, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, we have a long history of segregation and racialization. Uh, the racial minority population is limited in size in Kentucky. Um, so how do you think racism is relevant even for predominantly white communities such as Kentucky? I think that it's very com complicated and it's complex. And um, I'm one who routinely challenges, you know, I'm in Los Angeles and there is an assumption that places outside of the South are racism free and places in the South are the places where racism exists. What I would offer is that there are, as I said earlier, different kinds of racism and particular forms of racism that are recognizable as such. Um, racism operates in part because of the advantages that it affords groups, not just the disadvantages. And key here would be thinking about the, the power piece. So, um, regardless of the population size, who it is that has the power to make decisions or has power over other populations, that's the piece that really needs to be targeted for change. And, and here I, I would be remiss, even if this is virtual, not to mention some of the amazing work happening, for instance, in Louisville with um, a lot of my um, great friends who, are, who have been working on these issues for many, many years with uh, Surge and other organizations. So, so I think that, yeah, I, I would leave it there. So we have a, a question from our audience. Uh, can you speak to efforts to demand more rigor in the analysis of race, ethnicity, and racism in health studies? And what steps can current health researchers take to move the bar higher? I think the the, um, the the initial question about the JAMA um, podcast actually speaks to this ironically. And that is that we need to recognize that journals, um, agencies, funding agencies, um, funders, you know, the institutions where we work, that these are targets for intervention too, at least they should be, because they shape how we are even able to do the work. And, um, and I believe that that's a big part of where it, has, where it has to happen in terms of being able to evaluate it. On the one hand, for instance, I'm really delighted that the NIH is investing a lot of resources in funding on um, structural racism and so forth. I'm delighted the conversation is being held. On the other hand, I'm extremely concerned um, who is going to evaluate these applications? Is the NIH in a position? Are these, um, you know, who? It raises questions about who has the competency necessary to chart the course for the NIH. And I'm just using the NIH as, a, as an example, as a placeholder here. But does it presume to already hold this expertise and that simply calling for a lot of grants will, will solve the problem? These points are necessary because people are actually, people have been trying to do rigorous research in this area for a long time, but when it comes time to publish it, the value of the work is not recognized. And so I believe that doing the work that we believe is best to the best of our ability is important, but another equally important part is targeting these institutions, the decision makers, even our own institutions which for instance, perhaps paternalistically, right? So not necessarily just in a mean spirited way or um, a very dismissive way, um, fail to recognize what we're doing or fail to realize the importance of challenging from within. Instead, um, encouraging us or maybe our mentees and maybe we're the ones doing it too, um, to take the safer route to take the route that's easier, to take the path that's well-trodden within the field. So um, those are all pieces that I think are absolutely critical. 
I believe that if those elements are addressed, then the rigor of the work will be improved because, and here I speak as an empiricist, simply having the space for us to do the work will itself improve the work. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this is, uh, I guess, more of a personal question for you, Dr. Ford. Um, you know, as, as a woman of color, how have you navigated bias and racism in the academic enterprise in the context of your work? You know, that question is a very difficult um, question. And I realize even in trying to respond to it, I feel an immediate dissociation coming into place. Um, but um, in some respects, I can say I've tried to be strategic by having some work that is what I would call my bread and butter work you know, not controversial. Um, and it would have just allowed me to, to maintain my job and, and so forth. And it was by virtue, or it is by virtue of having this sort of the standard work that I have been able to do the other work. The other thing I would say is that I have tried to push myself to be bolder, but not reckless, um, to be more, to be bolder than I thought I could be. Um, and I realized that so often, we censor our own selves unnecessarily. And so um, I've tried to push back um, in, in my own work in that respect. And then finally, I, I guess I would say that it has been important to me to limit the influence um, of, of naysayers and people who don't actually get the work that I'm doing and, and find ways to interact with people, whether they're at my institution or elsewhere um, who are committed to the, who are engaged in, deeply engaged in the kind of work that I'm doing. Um, and I hope that, that I'm also offering something back to them. Thank you so much. Uh, please join me everyone in, in thanking Dr. Ford for her uh, terrific presentation and for her thoughtful responses to all the questions that you had. Um, I realized earlier I didn't introduce myself. I'm Katie Cardarelli. I'm uh, Associate Professor of Health Behavior and Society in the UK College of Public Health. Um, I just want to close us today with a few brief uh, words. Uh, I do want to remind that you that all participants will receive a link to the recording of her presentation, which will be housed on the College of Public Health YouTube channel. Many of you I know have attended all of our College of Public Health sponsored events that Dr. Pettis Figueroa uh, described at the beginning of our session. And all of these events were um, specifically intended to promote an anti-racist future in academia. So I just wanna kind of bookend what Dr. Pettis Figueroa mentioned um, early in today's session in terms of what we've heard and learned throughout the series. And if you haven't viewed all the sessions, you can go back and uh, view them on the College of Public Health YouTube channel. I know I've used actual um, clips of the previous sessions in my class. Um, you know, we, the, first of all, we equipped you uh, to, with language to engage in discussion about racism and its relationship with health inequities. And we featured Dr. Gil G of UCLA, Dr. Luisa Borrell of City University, and Dr. Robert Fullalove of Columbia University, who all spoke about their research and what is needed to advance research. And uh, notably, Dr. G spoke somewhat prophetically in September about the rising racism aimed at Asian Americans during the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, recently we saw a mass shooting in Atlanta that may have specifically targeted AAPI populations. This horrific event demonstrates that we have much work to do. We equipped you with anti-racist tools to use in academia. Dr. Hamadani of Stanford University brought us tools from the SPARK program to build your confidence to engage in academic settings and conversations about race and racism. If you haven't visited the Stanford Spark website, I would really encourage you to do so. And then finally, in today's session, Dr. Ford uh, provided you with a specific empirical approach to anti-racism, the public health critical race praxis. 
We know that this approach challenges methods and results that have uncritically reinforced inequities. Dr. Perez Figueroa and I uh, conceptualized and organized these events for you that featured some of the world's leading experts with the following objectives. We wanted to enhance your ability to engage in thoughtful conversations about racism and its detrimental effects on health. We wanted to help you connect racism with its consequences, including law enforcement violence, mass incarceration, and multiple health inequities. And we wanted to highlight for you an important approach, public health critical race praxis to advance our understanding of racial inequities. So as we conclude our anti-racism series today, I wanna to challenge you to actively contribute to ending all forms of structural racism. What will you do to contribute to this equity imperative? In academia, we are uniquely positioned to educate the next generation of problem solvers, advocates, scientists, and elected officials. We can create a climate of inclusion and belonging for all, and we can teach our students about the reality of structural racism and to speak out when they see injustices, to be bold, as Dr. Ford said. But we can also advocate for local, state, and national policies that secure human rights and civil rights protections. We can demand clearer standards for biomedical research that include variables such as race or ethnicity, as we discussed earlier. Racism, bigotry, and xenophobia are not new in America, but if we work collectively, we can start to see change happen. John Lewis, the late civil rights leader and US congressman said, quote, we used to say that ours is not the struggle of one day, one week, or one year. Ours is not the struggle of one judicial appointment or presidential term. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime, or maybe many lifetimes, and each one of us in every generation must do our part." End quote. So as we conclude, um, what active role will you play in creating an anti-racist society? Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing your actions to end racism. Have a great day.